Hi, everyone. Uh, so, like I mentioned, this one's a bit more of a fun talk. It's kind of thinking, OK, a lot of the time people are talking about ChatGPT replacing us. And it's kind of that continuous debate on who's going to be faster at actually doing certain pieces of work. So a quick intro about me. So my name's Chloe. I currently work at a company called Theater UK. And um, I used to be a lot more into full stack development. And now I'm moving over into data engineering. It kind of helps you give context on this whole talk. It's from the perspective of somebody who's currently a data engineer. And just a little fun fact, um, before I turned 18, I actually lived in six countries and moved eight times, which is um, a bit weird, but quite fun. <laughs> OK, so a bit of stats about what people's thoughts are on generative AI. So a lot of people think that you know it's super common. It's used everywhere. Uh, there was a recent survey done by the conference board in the US, which found that uh, around only 9% of those who were surveyed use ChatGPT on a daily basis, but 56% use them at least occasionally. So it's quite. You, it's, it's used quite a lot. People do use it to kind of help them with work. On the flip side of it, there were about half of people who believed that the quality uh, produced by generative AI was at least as good as an experienced human workers. So I didn't notice at the time, but these stats are very matched. Now, those who said who replied here are not necessarily those who replied here. As we're going to see in this talk, sometimes the more you use ChatGPT, the more you know its limits, and the more you realize that having an experienced human worker could actually be better for you. OK, so. Um, lots of you have probably heard about ChatGPT, if not everybody. But to give you a bit of insight, um, by March 2024, it had about 180 million users. So it's very widely used. And also, developers absolutely love it. So one of the key uses of ChatGPT is writing code. So a big part of these users are developers that are you know, using it to generate code. Um, in my perspective, I'm a developer. I'm also a massive introvert, so I actually use it a lot to write emails and messages because I don't really know how to interact that well with people. But writing code is definitely what's top of the list over there. And this one's also kind of fun. It only took ChatGPT five days to reach one million users, which is quite a fun stat to have. So today, we're kind of going to split this talk up into three sections. Firstly, how are we conducting this experiment? Secondly, digging into the development and the application. And thirdly, I didn't make anything, any lies. We are going to be actually seeing side to side what's the difference between ChatGPT and a person building an energy generation platform. I, was, I didn't trust myself enough to make it a live demo, so it's going to be recorded. <laughs> When I first give this talk, or when I, I kind of talk about anything to do with a specific model compared to another, people always ask me, so why don't you use model Y instead of model X? The answer is you could. Um, you can try it with any model. The main reason why I use ChatGPT is because it currently is the best ranked one, according to Eval Plus, for code generation. Um, Eval Plus kind of does their own evaluation. Different people will rank it differently depending on what their testing methods are. But for now, ChatGPT4 is still up there, kind of top of the list, even though that it does have some quite close competitors as well. So that's why we're looking at GPT4. But um, you can definitely try it with other models as well to see how it compares. OK, how are we actually conducting this experiment? So why an energy generation data visualization platform, which is quite a mouthful to say, and why not something else? It could be for sustainability. It could be because you could do some nice graphics. But actually, this is more of an old story from back in my uni days. Um, kind of a poor, overworked student who had a lot, a lot of exams to study for. I was trying to find any way to, to procrastinate it. And I had the greatest and most nerdy way to procrastinate it, and that was to spend maybe too many hours in the day looking at this thing. Um, this is literally just energy generation in the UK. One of our mechanics lecturers showed it to us. And I don't think he knew how many of us procrastinated by just watching this go up and down throughout the day. So I thought, you know, why not revisit my university days and try and build something a little like this? So just to make sure that we set some ground rules so that the, the, the fight is fair between myself and ChatGPT, firstly, it can come this 
data platform can come under any format. So I'm not going to specify it to GPT when I am querying it. I'm not going to specify it to myself. It can be a website. It can be an app. It can be a BI tool. It can be whatever you want. Same sources are used in both cases. So we're going to be using something called Electricity Map, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, I kind of want to show the same data in both. So I'll show you the screenshots of both outcomes. So you can see that you know, we're making it fair. We're going to be showing the same data. And of course, the last one is it has to be done in one shot. You know, I can't just pause it. And we really want to make sure that um, you know, we're not waiting for anything, so just to make it completely fair. OK, so this is Electricity Map. If none of you have seen it before, it's, it's open source, which we love open source. It's always great. And they also make one of their APIs available. So if ever you want to test this, their API does show 24 hours of data. So would encourage you to have a look at it and try it out, because it can be used for a bunch of different things. OK, so before I show you the race, I just want to explain you know, how I built it um, as a data engineer and how ChatGPT built it. So firstly, as a data engineer, um, for those of you who aren't data engineers, there's three usual main components you have. You have ingestion, you have storage, and you have visualization. In the end, I actually didn't need to do any transformation, so I left this out just to make it as simple as possible. So I use some simple inbuilt tools. So there's sorry, some simple tools. There's Airbyte, which is um, open source, so it's great, and you can use it for ingestion. I use Google BigQuery for the storage, and I used Looker for the visualization aspect. So that's kind of the flow that I used as um, to build the data platform. A few things to consider. So we're ingesting data from an API. So Airbyte's taking that data from an API. Um, one thing uh, I knew by kind of trial and error is that you do have to flatten a nested object. Otherwise, uh, Looker isn't too happy about that data. So that's something we're going to see in that video. And what's good about Airbyte is it's got a native connector with Google BigQuery. So I don't need to create any native connectors. It's quite easy to plug and play. Then Google BigQuery, so we're only using it for storage, and we're only using a single data set. You can make it more complex. You can add some partitioning. You can add optimization. You can do whatever you want. But in this case, we're keeping it nice and simple. And then Looker, you know, keeping it a simple and usable interface. Of course, you can always add more graphics to it. You can share the report. You can embed it. You can do a lot of things. But that's kind of the things we want to consider at this stage, how to build this basic data platform. And that's what it's kind of going to look like. I am showing you these screenshots, because I'll show you a similar one for ChatGPT, so you know that the outcome we want for, from both is going to be approximately the same. So you've kind of got those three little key metrics at the top. You've kind of got the graph from the last 24 hours. And I really like this like breakdown, um, this breakdown of the different energy sources. So that's all you've got regrouped. OK, using ChatGPT. So ChatGPT really is all about the prompting. So there's a big, big subset of engineering called prompt engineering, which is focused to do with kind of how you query models to make sure you're optimizing the results you get out of it. There's a really nice documentation website, I forgot the name, which talks all about the different ways to do prompt engineering. Would highly recommend it. But let's just keep it simple in what are things to watch out for when you prompt. So the first one is tell ChatGPT that it's an expert. It likes to be flattered. No, but really, um, when you're telling it it's an expert in something, it kind of puts into context all the responses it's going to give to you, and you're kind of telling it, I want you to act as this certain, this certain person. Keeping your sentences short is always better. You're not confusing it. Um, this one is really important. Tell ChatGPT to ask you questions. So before it answers, it should ask you questions so that then you can clarify anything, and you're not wasting time. You know, it's generating things that you're not you know, not expecting, and you have to correct it all the time. Providing code and relevant context, so kind of helping it um, me help it give you answers which are more defined to your problem. Be assertive. Um, I don't, don't know if any of you guys do this, but a lot of my, people in my company like to say please and thank you to ChatGPT. They're really worried about an uprising one day. You don't need to do that. It doesn't make a difference. Just be assertive. Tell it what to do. And finally, providing feedback. So you will definitely see this when I'm going to be running kind of the, the demo. Providing feedback is super important with ChatGPT. And it might actually be its downfall. So this is what it looks like on the other side. So you can see it's relatively the same. I have put 
two of these here. Um, ChatGPT is definitely based on probability, so you won't always get the same thing out every time. Um, and this difference between the two, um, if you can spot the difference, you'll know what I struggled, struggled with when running the demo. If you don't, you'll definitely see the frustration in the recorded video. OK, great. So I promised a race. And a race is what you'll be getting. So before I press play, up there is ChatGPT. Down there is me. I have put a timer so that you can see that I have not paused it at any point. I've just kind of concatenated these two videos. I'm going to try and um, commentate this as it runs. I'm sorry if I fall behind. I'm not a sports commentator or anything like that. OK, let's give it a go. OK, the race has started. So ChatGPT, I'm currently writing all of the prompts, very long prompting. Down on the bottom right, I'm running uh, all the kind of integration for the ingestion of the data. I'm giving it all the details about the API and how I kind of want it to concatenate all the data. In the top left, ChatGPT, I'm still writing a lot of text. I'm explaining to it um, what it should be doing. But like you saw, it's asked me questions, and I'm currently responding to those questions. On the bottom right, I've really lucked out with these nested objects, because there's about 20 nested objects that I need to flatten. So that's really taking a lot of time. In the top left, still writing. Code's already been generated, so ChatGPT is now ahead. There's a lot of code being written. Bottom right, I'm hand having to handle permissions, because uh, Airbyte definitely needs to be pushing data into Google BigQuery, so I need to make sure it's got the permissions to do so. Top left, I've asked it to put all the files um, in a folder, and I'm now putting it in VS Code. Ah, we hit the first problem with ChatGPT. There's now an error that's come up. Bottom right, I'm currently ingesting a data. Top left, you just saw the first apparition of the data, um, data platform. It's looking a bit dodgy, though, so I'm kind of giving it a lot of feedback. Bottom right, I'm ingesting the data, so that's kind of testing everything and bring it up. Top left, still struggling. The graphs are looking a bit better, but those dials really aren't working out. Uh, bottom right, still ingesting it. Top left, you might have seen a picture of me showing it what a dial is, because it doesn't understand what a dial is, but that's coming up. Bottom right, I'm now onto the visualization, so data's all there. I'm kind of neatly just putting everything up there. Top left, it's finally understood what a dial is. That's great. So that's looking quite good. Um, bottom right, almost done. Have already done the graph. Top left, dial is done. We're just doing all the graphs up there. We've kind of got those two ones at the top. Bottom right, I'm currently looking at the graph. I'm changing all the colors, making it look nice and pretty. And it's not yet stacked, but that's where it has to get to. Oops, stacked came up right there. Top left, still struggling with that design. It's not looking quite right. It's giving it a whole bunch of feedback, trying to correct that code. Bottom right, almost done. I think I'm just renaming a few things to make it look quite nice. Top left, giving it a list of feedback of things it's need to correct. Bottom right, already done, 26 minutes. Top left, chat GPT is still going on. It's really struggling to understand what a stacked graph is. It hasn't got any of the colors right. I think it put four different series in purple, which was really hard to visualize. Oop, got the colors right that time around. Um, but still, lots of feedback. It's kind of, I should have made it quicker for how it generated code, but it's still struggling with graph. I don't know if you saw that picture come by where I was trying to tell it, this is a stacked graph. Um, if this was slowed down, you're going to start seeing the passive aggressive messages that I'm giving ChatGPT because it's not understanding <laughs> what a stacked graph is. Um, all of these interactions, at one point, I do literally ask it, uh, do you know what a stacked graph is? It does, it just doesn't want to give it to me. <laughs> so this is. Keeping going again and again. At one point, I am going to give up on this. I'm just going to let you guys suffer through this, just like I suffered through this. At least for you guys, it's six times the speed, so that's a bit better. And now it's just reformatting a few things. I think I've given up on the stack graph at this point. Yep, I have. I'm just giving things the right dimensions. By this time, I think I already went to go make a coffee or a tea or something like that. And that's still a struggle up there. 42 minutes. We're not too far away. Just finalizing the small little details. And done. OK. <laughs> Thank you. So what happened? What happened here? So ChatGPT is still lagging behind, but the main point is it's not consistent. So back when I showed you the results of ChatGPT, there were two there were two different things. There was one, which was the one whose race you just saw, where it doesn't understand what a stacked graph is, and there was another one which looked 
really pretty. Let me just go back there. Um, there you go. This one here looked really nice. That one actually took 25 minutes to develop, which was way quicker than me having built the data platform. ChatGPT got everything first time around. It was, it was amazing. But it's really not consistent. So even if you're using very similar prompts, if not exactly the same prompts, it can take anywhere from 25 minutes to 45 minutes. So it's simply not consistent. You, it, you can't rely on it to be faster than a developer. So this is what kind of happened to ChatGPT. This meme you probably have seen a lot of times used for different reasons, but this is a good way to apply it. When you don't use it, you know, you spend a whole bunch of time coding, maybe three times the time debugging. To be fair, that's usually shorter. It's not too bad. With ChatGPT, you're spending basically no time coding, but <sighs> debugging really, really does suck at this point, especially when you're trying to only use ChatGPT and you can't touch the code yourself. So for example, somebody who has no coding experience, if they're trying to use ChatGPT, it takes hours to decode and understand what's going wrong, especially if ChatGPT doesn't understand that it is wrong and it's kind of just fighting you on it. So what were the key differences we saw when we were going through kind of this race between the two? So the first one is ChatGPT decided to pull data directly from the API. I didn't specify anything for kind of long-term plans. I just told it, you know, data comes from this endpoint. So it chose to take data directly from the API, while I chose to use an ingestion tool and a database. So in this aspect, there's kind of a difference in understanding of scalability. So I was very much thinking long-term. I knew this endpoint only gave me 24 hours of data. So if I wanted to, you know, keep that data in stock on the long term and have a bigger timeline, I needed to store that data. So that's kind of the first difference you had there. The second, the second thing that was different is basically the way it was built. So ChatGPT decided to build from scratch. Um, everything was code. It actually used HTML, um, JavaScript, and CSS. And I chose to use just some existing tools that I knew about that would make life a lot easier. So in this case, there was, there's two things, though. There's one which is experience. So knowing which tools to use depending on your context. But then the other thing is also access. You know, ChatGPT can't, it currently can't go into, it can't go into um, Emma, it can't go into BigQuery, it can't go into Looker, so it's not really able to just log in as you and develop the same thing. So that's currently one of the limits that you have there. This one's quite interesting. So subconscious preference um, is, so of course, some cultures, so you won't realize that you're doing this. But when you are building a dashboard, you know in your mind the sort of things that you want to see. So for example, you kind of know the feeling like a stacked graph will look better. It'll look better than just like a table of numbers. You know, you might want a dial to look a certain way. You might want these specific type of colors to make things a lot nicer, which is why in the ChatGPT case, it needed a lot of iterations, because you don't know what you're looking for until you see something you don't like. And so that's where there's that iteration that comes in where it will show you something, you're going to tell it, I don't like X, Y, Z, and it's going to have to correct it. Well, if you're building it yourself, you're kind of building it with the subconscious preferencing that is happening in the background, so all your components are being put together um, with those ideas. And finally, complex problem solving. So, ChatGPT is great for like simple problems, so it's good to get you started. Um, but the problem is, one, uh, it won't necessarily have the context. It also, in this case, it can't run directly uh, for testing. You might want to make something where you could get ChatGPT to generate code, and then you know you run it, you put tests on it, etc. Um, that's something you could do. I didn't do in this case. Um, but ChatGPT is helpful for debugging. So if you do give it an error, it will self-correct most of the time, um, so it's not that bad in that case. And on the developer side, sometimes it will take you longer to research errors, or you just know by experience. So for example, flattening that nested object, it could have taken me ages to figure out that's what was wrong. Um, I just knew it from experience. So those are kind of the four key differences that you saw during that video on how things were addressed when building the state platform. So if we wanted to rate this comparison, in terms of handling complexity, um, 
as an individual, you tend to be better in handling that complexity because you have the context of the project, you might have some background, you might have some knowledges of different frameworks, of different code, when it's going to adapt, and you'll have that wealth of experience of projects you've done beforehand to kind of help you with that. ChatGPT is great for setting things up, so for more basic applications, or for things where you're giving it enough context for it to be able to answer you correctly. So that's kind of the difference in the rating there. It also links together with that customization. So if you want to make some really fancy graphics of some fancy front ends that corresponds uh, to your application, um, you'll be slightly better as a developer because of that some conscious bias or some conscious um, preferences that you have, which ChatGPT it can't read your mind. It won't know. It won't know these things. In terms of technical expertise required, well, ChatGPT, any, anybody can write a message in ChatGPT, so you don't really need that technical expertise there. It doesn't quite have that five-star um, five uh, notation there, because if something does go wrong, you do at least need to have some semblance of knowledge um, to be able to query it, uh, get it to improve itself, etc. So not quite four marks. And time to market. So this is really interesting, because people will often say, um, if you use ChatGPT, everything's going to go quicker. You're going to be able to you know, make everything go into production, production being the key word, quicker. Um, like we saw in that video, it's not the case. Because as a developer, yes, we might take a while to code. We might take a while to write our tests. We might take a while to just make sure that everything's in place. ChatGPT will generate code fast. But then if you're spending three times or four times the time debugging, making sure it's working, um, you're not going to I mean, I hope you don't go into production with something that's broken and just take it straight out of ChatGPT. So that's why they kind of rate in equal timing here. Setup time. Um, like we saw in that video, ChatGPT generated files pretty quickly. So you can actually just ask it to put all the code in a folder, and then you can kind of um, just do an npm run dev or something like that. And quite quickly, you will actually have something that appears. Um, even though there was a bug at the start, the error corrected itself quite quickly. So you do have kind of a basic setup that happens quicker um, with ChatGPT. So it's a good way to you know, get started. And finally, of course, very important, scalability and security. Um, it once again relies on kind of context market experience and knowing what your client's kind of security strategy is. Um, that's why kind of having more of that knowledge is better. You can train models to actually have quite good security, but then getting it to implement it will be difficult because you'll need accesses, you'll need all of these different things that ChatGPT does not have. OK, so why, why are we actually talking about these two solutions as if they're non-complementary? So most of the time, you're either doing this subconsciously or, I mean, this might be new, new, new use to you, but the best way to actually use ChatGPT is to combine both. It's to you know, use the best parts of being a developer, use the best parts of having ChatGPT, and just do a combination of both. What does this look like concretely? It's this kind of hybrid approach. So, on the kind of people side, what's really good about being human is having intuition, having creativity, knowing the context of your project, knowing the context of your experiences, and also having that capacity of debugging, you know, really knowing how to dig into certain places to get um, to better understand what's going wrong. Now, the biggest strength of ChatGPT is definitely its knowledge base, so being able to query it for a vast amount of information. It's a great learning tool, so if you use it right, you can learn quite quickly from what it's telling you. Amazing documentation. I don't know if anybody likes doing documentation. If you do, I think everybody would love you, but um, usually people don't like doing documentation, so it's great at doing that. And of course, it can speed things up. So even though it might not be great to generate an entire project by itself, it can generate smaller components quite well and should definitely make use of it. So the underlying message I kind of want to give to you is that ChatGPT is a great tool. So in kind of everybody I've talked to about ChatGPT, they've always said it's a great tool, but it's just not ready to replace us, um, at least not yet. Thank you. <laughs>